Good morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Church Online, and we're glad that you're with us this morning. Um, we record on Fridays, and it's a nice sunny day. I'm not sure what it's going to look like this morning on Sunday, but uh, it is what it is. We're glad that you can join us, though. Let's thank the Lord for the day. Our Father in Heaven, we are grateful for your creation and that your mercies are new every morning. Father, as we worship you today, we do so with gladness of heart because this is a day that you've made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we always are grateful that we can be uh, tuned to you, that we can be part of your family. We pray that you would touch our lives through your word and through the music this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus will 
persecuted church segment this morning we're going to be talking about uh, Colombia South America and I've gotten this information from Trans World Radio and uh, their partner station RTM in Colombia uh, Colombia is home to a number of guerrilla paramilitary and criminal groups and it's been long embroiled in internal conflict and but you know many former rebels have been abandoned the peace accords and now are uh, taking up arms again. There was a ceasefire for a while. Uh, the Colombian Christians uh, who had been involved in drug trafficking have withdrawn their participation after coming to know Christ, which is really great. But this has angered the drug cartels and the armed groups whose operations are substantially funded by uh, the drug trade. So they've been taking, taking action against the churches and against the Christians. So they're constantly being threatened, namely the churches and believers, uh, by these groups. So the persecution and of the churches and the Christians is most prevalent in rural areas uh, where a lot of the drug trafficking and things like that go. And unfortunately, the village people in these uh, rural villages are against the Christians, driving pastors and churches out to avoid the threats by the drug cartels and these paramilitary groups. The uh, ministry of Trans World Radio is very great in uh, northern South America, which is helpful. And one of the important ministries that they have is a broadcast called Women of Hope. There's a lot of domestic violence in the country, and that has only been aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but the Women of Hope is a very practical and helpful program for families and it is broadcast around the world but in Colombia obviously in Spanish. One gentleman whose uncle is a member of one of the guerrilla groups um, despite warnings from his uncle and after listening to the RTM programs he decided to become a pastor and help others experience God like he does. Uh, one day his daughter found herself caught in the crossfire between battling groups and lost her hearing because of an explosion but even amidst those hardships, Alejandro continues proclaiming the gospel faithfully. He's been able to see growth and, um, in the church and see people come to know Christ. So we're grateful for the ministry of Transworld Radio and, and these brothers and sisters in Christ down in Colombia. We're going to pray for them in just a minute. I got a note from um, Slavic Gospel Association. Uh, it, Russia is has continued to pass legislation making it increasingly hard for Christian groups to gather even for the Christmas programs and again the pandemic has caused a lot of trouble too. Uh, in Irkutsk, which is near Lake Baikal in southern central uh, Siberia, they have all that saying, uh, a team was heading out to a small village where they were going to uh, have a Christmas program uh, partly through the ministry of Emmanuel's child with which is supported by SGA. They had Bibles and gifts and all sorts of stuff. They pulled into the village and the pastor, Pastor Victor, said when we arrived we were told that we cannot have a meeting in the House of Culture, which is like the town hall. But it was joyful to see all the children gathered together despite the cold Siberian winter. Most of all, it was joyful to see and hear them running to us, shouting loudly, the Christians came, the Christians came. Now, take a guess at the temperature that for this outside Christmas meeting, 
15 below. Uh, the ministry team and children were undaunted. They gathered everyone together in the icy cold and held their Christmas program outside for all the people to see and hear. Standing in the open air, the advent of Christ was proclaimed along with a call to faith in him as Savior and Lord. And the pastor continued, we believe that this meeting will be a good testimony for the children and the rest of the villagers as well. May the Lord be glorified. Interesting that they would meet in 15 below temperatures outside for a Christmas program. Might we uh, have the same kind of dedication? And then lastly, uh, Open Doors USA um, threw these startling statistics out. I don't think I realized these, or I'm sure I didn't realize these, but they said at the t by the time you go to sleep tonight, on average, 13 Christians will die. 12 Christians will be unjustly arrested, detained, or imprisoned, and five believers will be kidnapped, all because they believe and follow Jesus. Wow. Let's pray for these brothers and sisters. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the brothers and sisters of, in Christ in Colombia. We pray for their safety amidst the uh, difficulty in the in the rural areas especially because of the paramilitary groups and the guerrillas and the drug cartels. Lord, you know the suffering that they undergo and also the domestic violence that is taking place. We just pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ that you would help them not only be good testimonies, but you would uh, shield them from these uh, persecutors. And Lord, may even some of them come to trust Christ as their Savior as they see the testimony of the believers. We thank you for the radio ministry. We realize that maybe this is the only contact that many people have with uh, hearing the Word of God and uh, hearing the Gospel. So we pray for the broadcasts like Women of Hope and the Gospel programming that go goes on. Lord, we're grateful for the believers in in uh, former Soviet Union countries and the Emmanuel's Child ministry to orphans and to families, especially around the Christmas season. We pray that many might come to trust Christ as their Savior. We thank you for that. And Lord, the statistics that we've just read are, um, are, are shocking, really, that uh, people die every day uh, because of their faith in Christ. Lord, that leaves families, children, uh, wives or husbands and friends in churches possibly without pastors. We pray that you would give them the comfort and the peace that they need and that you would raise up uh, strong believers. Lord, we don't know what we're facing uh, in our days ahead in this country. We pray that you'd help us to be strong and to be solidly attached to you and to your word. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for joining us again today as we are uh, in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, we're continuing through our study of this book. Uh, today's sermon, of course, is entitled For His Glory, and we're going to be looking at uh, this passage which highlights, excuse me, the uh, glory of God and really the things that he has done. But I want to start with something I was reading from the University of Pencil, uh, Pennsylvania Law Review Journal this week. It says, in the fall of 1932, my class, like many other before and afterwards, started through law school with an hour of agency under Professor Keedy. Uh, on the blackboard, he had written a firm, precise, in a prefer, firm, precise hand, four over two equals, so four and then two under it and an equal sign. It says, we stared at this uncomprehendingly and at the trim, stern figure on the platform insistently demanding a solution to the problem. It says, an eager novice called out six as the answer. Second volunteered two, and then the third eight, and a voice of some of the several co uh, confident men in the rear. What is the problem, Professor Kitty asked them. They had tried addition, subtraction, multiplication, uh, all of these things, but the professor noted that for one of any of those particular signs in the problem, pointing to an operation to be performed, they could not know what the problem was. And gentlemen, he says, unless you know exactly what the problem is, you cannot possibly give the right answer. The professor knew that in law, as in everyday life, too much time is spent trying to, trying to solve the problem, trying to solve the wrong problem, excuse me, like polishing brass on a sinking ship. Now, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, this is a controversial text as it introduces us to things like election and predestination. And I admittedly today approach this with you some, with some trepidation, knowing how debated it is among a number of scholars. But our commitment here at Grace and my commitment as a pastor is to preach the truth of the text as we come to it, not shying away with it, not skipping over it, saying I don't want to deal with that, uh, but rather asking the Lord for wisdom. Uh, he, of course, provides that by his Spirit so that we might understand what has been revealed to us, understanding that he has a purpose in recording these words for us uh, as we come to them this morning. And I've spent, as well, countless hours of study and research on this passage with some other ones related to this subject uh, here in just this past uh, December. Uh, as I was wrote a 19-page research paper on the subject of election and predestination. And I poured back over some of those resources again uh, this week, and as well as some additional ones in preparing for this morning. As with Professor Keedy's class, though, I think many times the text is approached with the wrong mindset. The class focused on providing a solution to a problem without knowing what it was in the first place. I think in many times this text is approached with the mindset of solving the God, God's choice, man's responsibility debate to provide rationale for our minds rather than starting with the main subject of this text, which is God's glory. Look at verses 6 and 13 to 14. It says this. It says, To the praise of the glory of his grace that he has freely bestowed on us in his dearly loved Son. Look at verse 13, the last half. It says, You are marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, who is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. And so we approach this text this morning, we approach it with that mindset. This text is about what God has done for his glory. It speaks of our spiritual wealth in Christ, which affects our spiritual walk, as individuals, as churches, as, as spouses, as families. But again, it's about his glory. Paul is speaking of, or he's going to unfold in here, our privilege uh, before he gets to our practice in the last half of this letter. Now, I understand that some of these doctrines are hard to comprehend. Uh, we wrestle with them. We have a lot of questions. And I'm going to try to address some of those things as we go through this text in our limited time this morning. 
I pray, though, that we are comforted by the fact that the Ephesians themselves are comforted by this text. Remember, Paul is not writing new information to them. He's already taught them about these things at this point. He, he's reminding them of what he's already taught them so that he might encourage them toward and really provide a basis for uh, the calls and commands uh, to practical Christian living that he gives, again, in this last half of the letter. And so we're going to start our study this morning, as Paul did, by focusing on God. We possess salvation, but it's really all about him, because he is the one who is the initiator, the provider, and the guarantee of it. And so we start, first point this morning, praise the Lord because he blessed us. Look at verse 3. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. Blessed is the God, or praise be to God. This, this Greek word is used only of God in the New Testament. Now, in our English, we see it a little differently because doesn't it just say blessed in the, next, in the end of the verse? Yes, it does. Uh, but it's a little bit different nuance of that particular word. This word, we see the beginning of the sentence, is always used of God in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, most of its uses as well are in the same light used of God. It means to speak well of or to praise. It's, it's a call really to praise. Remember last week when Kasi was talking about Psalm 146, the, those particular calls to praise there. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God as long as I exist. Now, now, why should we do that? Well, because first and foremost of who God is, right? As we look at his character and, and who he is as God, we find calls throughout Scripture to praise him. Most of the time, though, it's because those calls or uh, invitations, really, to praise God is because of what he's done. In the Old Testament, he's praised for several things, but we might highlight a few, his care of mankind, Psalm 68 and Psalm 144, his, his provision, Ruth 4, 1 Kings 1, his response to prayer, Genesis 24, 1 Kings 8, his, his deliverance, remember Paul, or excuse me, David's remarks time and time again in the Psalms of God's deliverance from enemies and from evil that we see in the Psalms. And in Ephesians 1, God is worthy because he has blessed us. Uh, he, we, we bless him, if you will, because he blessed us us, Paul says. Now, be careful with this because we don't want to derive from this that we should only praise God when we feel that he has blessed us. Paul's already said we have been blessed already with every spiritual blessing. And then he expounds in verses 4 to 14 what those spiritual blessings are beginning with God's election in the past and God's redemption both in the present and in the future. Notice well, as Paul's speaking of these spiritual blessings, these are not physical things. Uh, oftentimes the false teachers, when they see this, blessed you with every spiritual blessing, run right to the health, wealth, and prosperity, the be happy, healthy, and wealthy kind of things. That, that's not what Paul is speaking of here. These are spiritual blessings. They find their origin in God. And so for a believer to live effectively in society, they need benefits that have their source in God. So God has blessed the believer with every spiritual blessing necessary for their spiritual benefit. And we'll hit some of that as we go through. But Paul says these, he says these are in blessing in the heavenly realms or in the heavenly, some texts say. Now that doesn't mean this is some distant reality for us. They are available now, Paul says, because we are in Christ. Remember, that's our identity, that's our association constantly as Paul writes about these things. And the fact that we are considered blessed means they've already been given. But as one person remarks, the reason the believer does not receive spiritual benefits is not because God is in some way stingy or that they must plead for them, but because believers are not appropriating by faith what God has already bestowed on their behalf. I, I like to do woodworking. In fact, I have a number of woodworking tools. I'm constantly collecting them. Um, and gladly, or wonderfully, my wife approves of that. But I have woodworking tools that I use to build small projects and, and larger pieces of furniture. I, I often keep a stock of lumber, certain sizes and lengths and shapes in my garage so that I have it available when I need to make projects. I have skills as well to be able to build the items that I may need. I have various plans. I have a 
file full of stuff on my computer and at home as well uh, of, of plans to build various things and I can also look stuff up online. However, if I go to IKEA and buy a bookcase or a bookshelf, however you want to call it, I'm not appropriating what I already have, am I? I'm not using those skills, I'm not using the tools, I'm not using the lumber and the resources that are already mine to be able to, to make that particular item. Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Peter writes in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, His divine power has bestowed on us everything necessary for life and godliness through the rich knowledge of the one who called us by his glory and excellence. Again, we, we think of blessings primarily in terms of health and material things, but Paul's not speaking of health and, and he's not speaking of a health and wealth theology here. And sometimes when we read this text, we're tempted to say, but I don't feel blessed. You know, we have a, a culture today that's focused so much on, uh, it, it, it's only real when I feel that it's real. Paul says, in Christ, you are blessed. We have spiritual blessings. But as Paul calls us to in Colossians 3, we need to keep seeking him. We need to keep our focus on him, our, our pursuit of him. We need to, 2 Peter chapter 3, grow as well in the grace and knowledge of Christ. We have these blessings, but there's also that pursuit, there's that growth that we are continually to be about. Paul says, praise the Lord for he has blessed us. How so? How has he blessed us? Well, verse 4 begins expounding upon those spiritual blessings. And we second thing we come to this morning, praise the Lord because he chose us. Verse 4. What did God do? He chose us. The word here is eklego uh, in the Greek, which carries the idea of I pick out for myself or I choose. Uh, it's the word from which we derive this theological term of election from. And it speaks of God's free decision, but at the same time, not to the exclusion of human responsibility. God chooses man specifically for himself and for his purposes. And we find that not just mentioned here, but also in places like Romans 8 and 2 Thessalonians 2 and 2 Timothy 1, as well as 2 Peter 1. And this, this concept is, in this word is not just a New Testament word. We also find this concept within the Old Testament. God chose Israel, remember, for himself from among the nations of the earth, that they, might, with purpose, might be a light and a blessing to those nations. God chose as well, we, as we look through the New Testament and the Old Testament, Jacob over Esau. He chose the tribe of Levi over the others for the priesthood. We see God's choice throughout the scriptures, and his choice is never about the worthiness of the one of the person, uh, excuse me, of one person over another. Rather, as the sovereign creator of the universe, he has the right to make that choice as he pleases, in accordance with his character to bring about his greater glory. The motivation for that choice is not us, it's himself. Remember, this is all about his glory and how he's working that out. Specifically in the New Testament, though, if we were to define that theological term, election, it's this. It's an act of God before creation in which he, can, in which he chooses some to be saved, not on account of any foreseen merit in them, but only because of his sovereign good pleasure, which we see here in verse 4. It's a privilege uh, not so that we can just bask in it, though. In other words, not that we can brag about it and have disdain for others. Paul is highlighting these things so that we might praise God for what he's done in and through us. He's calling us to that. It also, again, becomes the basis for which he talks then about Christian practice. So who, we, we've answered the first question, what did God do? He chose us. Who did the choosing? I should have asked that one first, but of course it's God, isn't it? He's the subject. He's the one that has done the selecting. He is the one to be praised for what he has done. And this again highlights that the whole Bible is ultimately God's story showing the path to his greatest glory. And this is one of those aspects. And we are grateful, of course, that he took the initiative because if he didn't, no one would have his everlasting presence in life. In fact, if God looked down the quarter of time to see those who would choose him and respond to him, he'd find no one. And I appreciate the comments of one scholar 
on this saying this. The real problem is not why he chose some, but rather why he chose any. No wonder God is to be praised. When did this happen? Paul says in, uh, there in verse, verse 4, before the foundation of the world, before the earth was ever created, which we find also in a number of those passages that I mentioned uh, just before. This itself is comforting, those few words, because it reminds us we're not an afterthought. God didn't make the world and say, oops, I, I forgot something, I forgot to choose some people. Uh, no, he set his love on you long before you ever existed and even before the world itself existed. So take comfort in that. Why? What's the purpose? That's the last question to answer here. He says that we, that we should be holy and blameless before him. That's the goal. Uh, we are this, of course, presently in Christ. That's salvation. It's the only reason that we can stand before God. Uh, election, though, also speaks, I think, of our responsibility. It speaks of our sanctification. He chose us to be this. In other words, to be set apart. To be set apart from all sin and from the evil influences of this world. He chose us to be distinct uh, from the way the world thinks. Remember, we are part of a new kingdom. We serve a new master. And his values and, the, and what he uh, places value on, excuse me, is what we ourselves are to or to value and to consider, uh, rather than the things that this world chases after. He chose us to be blameless, to have integrity, to, to be the same person, both in private as well as in public. Again, why? We come back to that question, why? For his glory. That's the theme through all of this, for his glory. God is glorified through our salvation and through our sanctification as we are first saved through Christ and then grow in Christ day by day, further imitating him before a very lost world. Now, as strongly as I believe this passage and find great comfort in it and many reasons to praise God, I also know that it causes some folks great unrest uh, in their hearts and in their minds. And much of that unrest centers around the goodness of God and his choice of men, um, particularly with some of these questions. Is God really good if he didn't save everyone or didn't choose everyone? Is God a liar when he said he desires all to be saved? Or, or does God predestine people to hell? That's a very hotly debated question. Uh, does man really have freedom to choose? Uh, yes, no, no, and yes. And we're going to explore those just a bit, starting with the goodness of God. Yes, God is still good even if he didn't choose everyone. His goodness is irrefutable. Uh, time and time again, uh, Psalm 119, Luke 18, 1 John 1, among a host of other passages, speaks of his character in that light. He is good and to be praised for it. Remember, though, in contrast, what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, just as it, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. That's our state. If you flip over just a couple chapters to chapter 1, verse 32, you find there that, that those that have turned, their, turned away from God, they're involved reveling in sin, also are one, the same ones encouraging others to sin. Romans 5, we're haters, ungodly, enemies, and sinners. That, that's our state. And Paul drives this point home even further in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, when he says that we are not chosen because of our good works. There is nothing of inherent worthiness in us to make God say, I must choose that one. You know, so-and-so, they have the X, Y, and Z quality. Boy, I got to choose that one. No. In fact, apart from his goodness and his grace, no one would be chosen. Remember, goodness is defined not by us. It finds its definition in him because he is the epitome of goodness. And his goodness is seen, of course, here in his plan to redeem us from sin. It's, again, it's all about his glory, and he chose in grace to save some to the praise of his glory. Uh, is God a liar? No, no, he's not. Uh, Numbers 23 for Titus chapter 1 both speak to that fact. Uh, he is not a liar when he says that he desires all to be saved. The desire of God is genuine, just to say our desire for everyone to have clean drinking water. Uh, and I, I don't know that I can fully... Um, that can ever fully satisfy, solve this intellectually for us or satisfy everyone. Uh, but we are often only comfortable with God displaying attributes that are most agreeable to us. Uh, if we say then, 
that since God desires all people to be saved, that he must save everyone, we're putting ourself in authority over God to say that he cannot exercise his full character. Remember what? It's, it's all about his glory. All is orchestrated in this world in such a manner to fully display every facet of his character and every attribute of his being. And as uncomfortable as well as it is for me to say, even condemning people to hell in judgment brings God glory as his justice is executed. It's his character what? His character on display. Now, understand this. Hell is not only a place of torment for sinners. It's also the place where, which sinners choose. Remember, choose. Man's responsibility also in this by the rejection of God, of his word, and ultimately of his son. Um, does God predestine people to hell? No, I, I don't think so. Um, that's what we call the doctrine of double predestination. Some he chose for heaven, some he chose for hell. But the Bible clearly states, states that God chooses people to be saved. Uh, it never says anywhere uh, that God chooses people to go to hell. That's a logical assumption man has made, but that scripture has not made plain. In fact, scripture is silent on this particular issue. It's, it's what we would call a mystery. And if God is content on leaving it as such, we should stick to what the, the scriptures say teach and preach that, and then leave what God has declared a mystery, a mystery. And the last thing, freedom. Does man have the freedom to choose? Yes. Yes, he does. And, and how God's sovereign choice of man before the foundation of the world and man being held responsible for choosing him works, I have no idea. Uh, I have no clue. Uh, I know, though, that we are not robots pre-programmed with a predetermined response, all right? Uh, God chooses man. He also invites man to choose him, and man is then held responsible for his response toward God. That's what the scriptures say. Think in the, for the Gospels, in the Gospels for a moment, of all the calls of Jesus to people. He says, believe in me, repent, follow after me. Time and time again, not always with those words, but sometimes with different ones, but there's still invitations for man to come. Uh, Ken Boa, in his book, God I Don't Understand, uses the word antinomy to describe this. Two equally valid truths that contradict one another. It's like a, par a pair of, of train tracks running parallel to each other. You know, they have to be in those particular positions. Both of this, the God's choice and man's responsibility, are taught within Scripture. And even though how they work together befuddles us, understand this, God knows. It's a mystery to us, but it's understood by Him. And these two truths, God's choice and man's responsibility, they were never meant to be emphasized in isolation of each other. In fact, we find many of these, what someone has called uh, uh, paradoxical pairs, uh, within the scripture, truths that we are to hold in tension. The problem we have is that denominationalism has tended to remove that biblical, remove that biblical tension by emphasizing only one of those conflicting truths over the other, and that is where we run into the problem. We have to keep these two things in tension. Uh, like the serpentine belt on your car's motor, you know, if that comes off or goes out of whack or it's not in the right place, <laughs> there's problems with your car. If we do not keep these in tension, our theology breaks down and we find ourselves swaying too far in one direction or the other. I appreciate Paul Tripp's remarks on this particular subject. Um, he says this, he, he was talking, he says, we are not called in Scripture to discern the secret will of God. In fact, he says, he says, the secret will of God, God is called the secret will of God because it's secret. Let's be content to leave it that way and instead just keep these things balanced and in tension. This election language in Ephesians uh, is primarily about God. It shows why God should be praised. Any conclusions then drawn must derive from the fact that this is a doxology. It's about God, about praising Him. Paul's intention is for us to worship God, to, to, to understand what He has done in our lives, and to provide that really as a basis then for the things he's going to be talking about later. He's focusing on God's work, His, his planning and His drawing people to Himself through Christ. Uh, the focus, again, of this text is on the election, the cause, God and its purpose, Christians to live holy and blameless before him. And God, again, he values human beings. He draws them, both Jew and Gentile, to himself. But the focus is on his grace. 
and provides, as I said, ethical grounds then for the last half of the book. It calls us to live lives of service to God. Ultimately, we take away from this verse and really the whole passage that God is to be praised. Paul says what? Verse 3, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's to be praised because uh, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He's to be praised because he chose us, which is not a, a bragging right again for us, by the way. We are not so much better than another. It's all about his grace. I didn't deserve it. Salvation itself is a gift. The only thing I am left to do then is to praise God for what he himself has done. The third thing this morning is this, verse 5, praise the Lord because he adopted us. Look at verse 5 with me. It says he did this by predestining us to adoption as his legal heirs through Christ Jesus according to the pleasure of his will. Predestination, another hotly debated theological word. And it, it shouldn't scare us, though. This continues to define for us the spiritual blessings that are ours in Christ. Um, if we define it as a word or as a theological term, it means to foreordain, to, to come to a decision beforehand, to decide beforehand, to determine beforehand, to decide upon ahead of time. Now, it sounds very similar to election. In fact, often in, in theological jargon, they are used interchangeably, but there's a difference in the emphasis of these two particular terms. Divine election refers to God's selection in eternity past of those whom he will in time save by his grace through the sacrificial death of Jesus. This choice was made long before we were even born. And it's independent, again, of any works or merit on our part. Predestination, then, as a term itself suggests, is the define, divine decision uh, to form, uh, as to the form, excuse me, uh, which those blessings will take. Uh, predestination tends to focus more on God's plan and on the outcome which he has predetermined. And we could illustrate it this way. Um, if I was a rich person, and I'm not, uh, financially anyway, uh, if I was a rich person and I wanted to uh, enrich the lives of some young people in my local community, perhaps at the high school, and provide 10 scholarships, uh, I could choose uh, five men and five, five women. Uh, again, m that's my choice as to who I choose. I could choose 10 men, I could choose 10 women, or, or a variation of whatever. But when I choose those 10 recipients, that is election. I'm the one making the choice. When I set up the scholarships, though, at 10 different universities, I plan each program for the particular person I have chosen. This is predestination. Predestination. In election, God chooses the person. In predestination, God establishes the program for that person. Specifically, adoption. What? As sons and daughters. Uh, predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Those he has chose, that's his plan for them. It's his plan, though. Done in love based on the good pleasure of his perfect will with the purpose of glorifying himself. And it, again, it does not relieve man of his responsibility to believe. What are we predestined to? Again, adoption. Uh, what does that mean, though? You know, when we think of it in our own culture, perhaps we think of a court date where you go and you sign a bunch of papers. And Roman culture, though, it means at least three things. First of all, it was a complete break with the old family and a, a new family relation with all its rights and privileges and responsibilities. And understand those last three terms there. Rights, privileges, responsibilities. That's what we have, new ones, as God's adopted children. Second thing, adopted, the adopted son became an heir to his father, new father's estate. No matter how many other sons he had, he was now a co heir. It doesn't matter which family he came from. He's a part of this family now. That's the one he's connected with, and he is a co-heir of it. And the third thing, the old life of the adoptee was completely erased. Uh, its debts and obligations legally were canceled, and he was regarded by law as a new person. One of the emperors of Rome, uh, around the time some of these things were written, had, had adopted a son. And uh, it's said uh, in history, of course, that he wanted to marry his sister, which would be the, the original daughter, if you will, of his adopted father. By Roman law, though, he could not, because he was now considered, he was a new person, he was this uh, adopted father's legal son, and to do those things was illegal at the time. In fact, they changed the law, it says, so that it could happen. Uh, so just to give you some context of this and, and what it means. Taking this, though, um, into our spiritual context as believers, one commentator writes this. 
In like manner, believers, when they are adopted, are removed from under the authority of Satan and given a new Lord, who is now also their father. They are guaranteed an inheritance with all the children of God, of which the Holy Spirit, again, scriptures, is a down payment and guarantee. The Spirit is also the witness that adoption has taken place. Finally, new, they are new persons. All their sins are forgiven. They have a clean slate before God. He says, what a tremendous blessing to know that God has made us his own. Now, this is a bunch of great stuff. It's, it's a bunch of theological stuff. What difference does this possibly make in my life today uh, or in our lives as believers? Three things. First is this. Adoption emphasizes our new relationship. This is not a religion, all right? And when we treat it as such, we, we find a very different approach to it. This is not a religion, though. This is not a system of doing right things to gain entrance into heaven. We have a relationship with the God of the universe. He is our Abba Father. We live in a broken world. We live in a, in a world with destroyed relationships. People disappoint. They deceive us. But our Abba Father, we can draw near to him. You can draw near to his loving arms and know that he will receive us as his beloved children. Second thing, adoption emphasizes the security of our future. And there's much concern right now politically for the future of our country. There's growing concern financially and even uh, what laws may be made in the future and, how, and what the things we may face. We look beyond all of that, though, to the future that awaits us in glory. Because being adopted by God means that we are fixed for eternity. God has written us into his will, so to speak. Because he did, did it totally by his grace and not at all because of anything in us, it is certain that he will keep his promises. And third thing, adoption emphasizes our new family. Uh, in a, we live in a world today that speaks of unity. Uh, here, though, in the church, and I understand that the church is not always perfect, uh, but in the church we find a true unity. As people profess faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior and become a part of that, that, the church, the body of Christ, Within the church, national and racial and economic backgrounds don't matter. And I think of all the families around the world that are broken. I think of, uh, of those as well that have been abandoned by their families. With God, we have a new family, a perfect one. Well, <laughs> in heaven ultimately. We're, we're still sinners here, but we still sin. But um, in this family, the young and the old enjoy being together. We all care for each other. It doesn't matter on your status. Uh, we learn from each other, young and old alike. It's, it's where we get to know one another and get together regularly as well. It's where we share in the things of God. Appreciate some questions and remarks. Someone had made it says, why do people fail to live in relation to God and to serve him? Is it not because most of the time we view God as a remote being cut off from us and not involved with us, a being whose expectations are not important or at least not in the reality we know. Ephesians, more than any other book, seeks to show that God is not remote, that he has been and is active for us, and that he will affect both individuals and the church by what he does. This God we worship is not a remote God like the ones that were worshipped of old, all right, or that some that are even worshipped yet today. He is our Father, and we are his children, and life is lived before him, and his spirit has been given to us. Life itself is relational, both in relation to God and in, in relation to people. And the text focuses on life in relation with, as relation with God. You know, people today often fear that they're missing out on something in life if they live in relation to God. What they will miss, though, is the distortion and perversion of life without God and the heartbreak that results. Life with God, with God is not some minimalist approach to it. Rather, God's spirit is, is, has brought every privilege. And we find great meaning and great purpose as we live for him and in relationship with him. Of course, these words on adoption lead us once more, or lead us to the end of, verse, end of the, our verses this morning, verse 6, to the praise and glory of his grace that he has freely bestowed on us in his dearly loved Son. And I'd like to conclude with three statements of application here in verse 6. Now, these are not original to me. I don't claim credit for them, but they are indeed important for us to end with this morning. If you remember the title of the sermon, For His Glory, uh, that directly relates to this. And throughout our time in this text, I've tried to come back time and time again to that because it is all about His glory and His praise. 
We are his instruments that he uses in three statements to conclude with today. To praise God properly for the glory of his grace in Christ, we must remember what we were before his grace found us. We can never truly appreciate God's grace until we get the biblical perspective on the depths of sin from which God rescued us. I appreciate Paul's words in Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. For we too were, were once foolish, disobedient, misled, enslaved to various passions and desires, spending our lives in evil and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness of our God and our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not by works of righteousness that we have done, but on the basis of his mercy. Second thing, to praise God properly for the glory of his grace in Christ, we must recognize the extravagance of his grace. Uh, note just here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, freely bestowed on us. Uh, verse 8 of the same chapter, he lavished upon us. Chapter 2, verse 7, the surpassing wealth of his grace toward us in, er, in, of his grace in kindness toward us. Uh, all that we have, all that we are, it's God's grace. You know, and, and I wonder, as do many, how can anyone, much less an entire branch of what we would call Christendom, read these verses, these chapters of Ephesians, and then teach that we have to add any, we have to add good works to this, to what Christ has done in order to be saved. Our salvation is entirely due to the extravagant grace of God, and all glory and praise and honor goes to Him, and to Him alone. And the third thing is this. Uh, to praise God properly for the glory of his grace in Christ, we must see that he gave his beloved son for our salvation. Verse 6 ends with those words, dearly loved son, that's Jesus. It reflects that special relationship between father and son within the Godhead. We are in Christ. And when the father adopts us into his family, we are drawn into this circle of infinite perfect love. Dearly loved son also highlights for us the great price that God paid to adopt us as his children. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Indeed, he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, freely give us all things? Remember, it's all about God. It's all about his glory. He is to be praised for blessing us beyond measure in our wildest imaginings. He is to be praised for choosing us before the foundation of the world as a measure of his grace. He is to be praised for adopting us into his family at great cost. And the angels and the elders and the living creatures in Revelation give us appropriate words of praise to conclude with this morning. Revelation 7 verse 12 says this, Praise and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we see this, as we come to this text today, as we've studied it, we are left with nothing but praise for you. If we're honest, there's things that puzzle us, things that maybe concern us, because we don't fully understand. But we see what you have done for us. Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us so much. We understand this, of course, is all about your glory. And I, and I pray that we as we see this text, and it is all about you, that we would live our lives in the same manner. If every single moment of our day lived with the focus of honoring and glorifying you. Give us the strength to do that. We thank you for your spirit who's within us, molding and shaping us into the image of Christ day by day. May we be yielded to his work that we might further bring glory to your name. We pray this in your name. Amen.
benediction today um, I think it fits well to go to uh, Romans chapter 11 and see how great are the ri God's riches and his wisdom and knowledge how impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways for who can know the Lord's thoughts and who knows enough to give him advice who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back for everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for what his glory all glory to him forever, and God's people said, Amen. Amen.